good day. Today we start our lecture which is lecture number 27 and uh, this is the, the design of springs. Now for the design of springs uh, we start with the how we define basically a spring all of us know what is spring we have used springs in everyday life. So, basically we can say that the springs are used as a flexible joint between two parts or bodies. Now, here you are having some sort of objectives for the spring. What is that one? First of all to cushion absorb or control energy due to shock. This is a very common thing what we find out the application of the springs in car springs or railway buffers and to control energy due to shock is a well known situations for the springs supports and vibration dampers. Next to control motion what is this idea to control motion means maintaining contact between two elements as cam and its followers. You understand that when uh, if you just think of the cam and follower arrangements uh, widely used in so many applications then you will be finding out a spring is there which always keeps the contacts between the cam and the followers thus it controls the motion. Now whenever uh, you see someone driving a car he uses a brake or a clutch for the car control of the car control as far as the motion is concerned and there what you do you apply your brake which again eventually is having a spring system and the clutch is also having a spring system which engages and disengages uh, aided with the mechanism of a system of springs or a single spring like that. And another one is a restoration of a machine part to its normal position when the applied force is withdrawn. A typical example you know uh, that uh, in turbines uh, in, uh, in the turbines suppose if we take an example then what we see that uh, whenever you are having to control the speed okay, which is going on increasing or decreasing a governor system is used which controls the motion or the rotation of the turbine wheels and thus uh, say the flow through the uh, turbine veins by the governor mechanism which controls a series of uh, say veins for inlet water impingement like that and that is also controlled by springs and uh, here we use again as an some sort of a control motion and uh, that is also using a spring governor and another example that some valves actuator valves are also having the spring which can have a some arrangements for the control motion. And the very common use of spring you can see the measure to measure forces that is the spring balances and gauges what you utilize is a spring and to store energy uh, in clocks and or the starters. However, uh, we do not find much of the winding clocks nowadays, but still uh, you must have seen the clocks uh, the spiral type of springs which first you uh, wind it to coil and then gradually it recoils uh, and to the stored energy is recoiled and this phenomena also you can see in the toys used by the children. Now in the lecture design of springs we will consider two aspects one is the design of helical springs another is the design of leaf springs. These two springs are very widely used in actual practice or actual fields in so many cases and some of the examples just now what I have seated. So, we start our 
lecture or with the design of helical springs. Here we start with the commonly used spring materials. One of the very important thing is the choice of the spring material so that the purpose for which the spring is made is actually performed nicely. Now in this case normally if you are having the springs of very small diameter and the wire diameters are also small then the springs are normally manufactured by, by a cold drawn process through a mandrel. However, for the very large springs having also large coil diameters and wire diameters uh, one has to go for manufacture by a hot processes means after heating the wire and then using a proper mandrel to wind the coils. Now, coming back to our discussion on the spring materials, we see here that the common spring steel which is called the hard drawn wire is the cheapest among all and it is normally used for low stress conditions and static loads. The material is not suitable for sub zero temperatures or temperatures above 1 degree centigrade. This is a very common cheap type of springs what we can use in everyday life. Next comes the oil tempered wire, it is a cold run wire, but after that it is quenched tempered uh, uh, and it is again a general purpose steel. However, it is not suitable for fatigue or sudden loads also at sub zero temperatures and also at temperatures which are above 180 degree centigrade. When you go for very high stress conditions then alloy steels one of these is a chrome vanadium steel is uh, used. It can be used at a moderately higher temperature around 220 degree Celsius and uh, this has got a very good fatigue resistance and long endurance for shock and impact loads. Another one is also the chrome silicon. This material also uses for highly straight springs and it offers an excellent service for long life shock loading and temperatures uh, relatively higher than chrome vanadium that is around 250 degrees Celsius. So, these two type of steels are as you can see are used for the fatigue conditions. Music wear. This is the most used wear for small springs. It is the toughest and has the highest tensile strength and can withstand repeated loading at high stress values. However, it cannot be used at sub zero temperatures or at temperatures of 180 degree centigrade. But uh, uh, you see that normally when you talk about the springs uh, you will be finding out that music wire comes out a very common choice because of the reasons just stated. Now, other one is the phosphor bronze or spring brass these are also quite used and uh, it has good corrosion resistance and electrical conductivity that is the reason for the electrical contacts and other things you use this type of spring materials. Spring brass has a property that it can be used also at sub zero temperatures. Now, there are <coughs> several other uh, spring materials like uh, stainless steel also uh, and some more alloying elements. However, in this particular one the names of those materials are given which are very common in everyday practice. <coughs> now, 
let us come down to the the stresses what occur in helical spring. Now, to look at the helical spring situation, let us look at uh, the figure first. This is a schematic representation of a ski uh, of spring. So, this is the coil cross sections. Okay. Now, these are the coil cross sections. So, if you look this coil is actually owned in this fashion and this bold one what you can see these are all outlines of the coil. Okay. These are the coil this is going like this another one is like this. So, so and so forth. Now, this is a cut section means the end from the entire coil somewhere you make a cut and as a reason it is given in a shaded way. Now, if you look at the free body diagram then what we will be getting we just concentrate on this particular zone then what you see is that if we look for this one then obviously, at a cut section you are having a vertical equilibrium will give you the force the directly this force which is a shear force coming in this direction and the cut section the torque which will be coming over here is in this direction and there is no horizontal force coming into picture because there is externally there is no horizontal force present. So, uh, just for um, from our fundamental ideas of the free body diagram you can see that this is a situation uh, any section of a spring is experiencing that is simply a torque and a force this is a shear force. Now, you know whenever there is a shear force you know that there will be an associated some amount of bending moment, but you do not see any bending moment over here. The reason you just try to analyze yourself, the reason I am telling is because simply it is a curved one. As because it is a curved one, then that is the reason there is no bending moment appearing in the free body diagram of this particular cut section of a spring. Now, as we have learned earlier that the stresses that will be generated due to the torsion as well as the direct shear can be can be computed using the simple equations and we can superimpose the stresses that is occurring due to the torsion and direct shear and thus we will be getting the final expression. I have written here the final expression as tau max as k s 8 f d pi d q. Let us see that how we get this simple relationship. Now, as we have seen I am not drawing the entire one, entire picture I am not drawing I am just look into this one. So, if we have a cut section and we are having an torsion t and uh, direct shear f that is acting into this direction. So, what is the shear stress due to torsion tau t that we know from our fundamental ideas that t r by i p we know all the notations okay, the standard notations we are using. What is the torque that is acting here that we have seen from the free body diagram this is the f and this happens to be the radius of the coil or the total one well just one second. It is better that I give the notation as is given in the earlier figure. So, this distance comes out to be d by 2. So, if we replace one after other then what you get you get t 
this t magnitude of t comes out to be a into d by 2 what is coming out to be this small r small r means here from here it is a small r so at this location we are giving it is as d by 2 ok where d stands for the diameter of the coil this has got the diameter I am sorry diameter of the coil where divided by i p. So, that gives you the pi d to the power 4 by 32. So, if we simplify then what comes out to be 8 f d by pi d q. So, the force due to tau direct how you get it? this tau direct will be coming out to be the total load by area. So, total load is f and this comes out to be pi by 4 d square. So, that means it comes out to be comes out to be equals to just one second. O f by pi d square. So, we get one stress due to the direct one and another one we are getting due to the torsion one. So, what is the net stress that is acting onto the spring at any point? It will be the summation of this one and this one. Now, one thing I just would like to mention here, see we have taken the average stress, although we know that there is an distribution of the stress, direct shear stress, but here we have taken just as an average stress. So, if we try to put another notation as tau max, then what we note down? We note down that it should be the summation of tau t and tau d, but at the point where it should show up the maximum. If we look into this one, then you can see that at this location, the direction of this is a the direction of the tau t, this tau t. So, if I just give another one, uh, just one second, if I give this as tau t, this as tau direct, d that stands for tau direct, then here we are getting an summation effect. However, if you look into this one, you can see the shear stress will be here and here, this is tau t and this is tau d. So, it is a uh, minus of this one. So, you take this one minus that one will give you the value. So, obviously, when we consider the value tau max, then we find that it will be the summation of tau t plus tau t and this comes out to be the tau max maximum. Means, tau max means it represents a maximum shear stress that is occurring and you can see this maximum shear stress is occurring if we uh, look to this particular spring uh, as a whole, I am just um, giving you the, the idea just here once again. Okay. So, if you look to this one, that means a series of springs like that, we, what we have drawn earlier, let me okay. So, what it is giving, this is a spring acted upon by the force A. At this zone, we are always getting, similarly if you look at this one, we will be always getting at the inner side. So, the inner side, this is the inner side of the spring, which always gets heavily loaded. So, 
the spring failure is expected always to have from the inner side of the spring and that actually really happens. Now, you might be questioning that I have taken an example where the spring is in tensile mode, it means you are, you are actually pulling the spring. If this is a spring, then you are pulling the spring like this. So, this is what you are getting the spring. Now, what I mean to say is that had the spring had the spring was in compressive mode then and then also you see the inner side of the spring. So, that means if you make a cut section here just to cut then you draw the cut section then what will happen to the free body diagram uh, load will go like this one and the torque from the free body diagram will be like this. See again you will be finding out this inner side is mostly stressed. That means, what is the idea I am just trying to define you or means explain you is that irrespective of a spring being in compressive mode or in a tensile mode, you will be always finding that maximum shear stress is occurring at the inner side of the spring. So, thereby the chances of failure or the, the failure starts always from the inner side. Coming back to this equation what we have derived tau max equals to tau t plus tau d. If we look into the entire form then what we have seen that we have seen like this that that tau max comes out to be how much 8 f d plus pi d cube plus 4 f by pi d square is all right. So, 8 f d by pi d cube plus 4 f d uh, 4 f plus pi d square. So, this one if we take common 8 f d by pi d cube what we get 1 plus what is this thing coming out to be 1 plus 1 by 2 into 2 into capital D by small d that is what you will be getting over here. Now, this one I suppose I am correct uh, if you take is common that means this is 8 means you divide by 2. So, if you are taking common d so d comes at the bottom and 1 d comes at the top which comes over here. Well, so if it is like this then we represent it normally I am just without writing, I am just erasing this portion. Okay. We write down this normally by an word 2 multiplied by capital C. So, what do you get? That C stands for capital D by small d, and, and this has got a name called spring index. Okay. Now, you can see that higher the value of the C, lower the effect of this 1 by 2 is will come into picture, the mostly predominantly it will be coming as the torsional stress. Now, this one including this particular one is again this entire situation means what I mean to say this entire group of 1 plus 1 by 2 c is written as a value k s. So, thereby we get an expression like k s into 8 f 
dt by pi d cube as a tau max occurring into a spring. So, let us go down to the earlier slide. So, you can see. So, this is what it has been written that tau max equals to k s by 8 f d by pi d cube where you where this k s is called shear stress correction factor and as I told you that k s is given by the expression 1 plus 1 by 2 c and where c is a d by d that is called a spring index. So, this is the equation for the maximum shear stress occurring in a spring. However, this particular one, this expression is sometimes again written as in the form k w 8 f d pi d q. We can see we have replaced the k s by k w. What is this one? Here this k w is the wall correction factor and named after an researcher who did a lot of work on the spring A m wall and that is a wall correction factor and this correction factor is given by this expression 4 c minus 1 by 4 c minus 4 plus 0 0.615 by c. Now, this is what you just see the heading the stresses in the helical spring with curvature effect. As a matter of fact, uh, it should be like this that means, this particular k w or the wall correction factor includes both the curvature effect and the shear stress correction factor together. So, I mean what you what is the idea of k w, k w or the total k if we consider this wall, uh, wall correction factor, then it contains what I was just telling that the curvature effect as well as the direct shear effect. Now, uh, one should know that I am telling every time curvature effect. What is basically an curvature effect? See, uh, this way we can uh, define a curvature effect or try to explain a curvature effect. So, if we if we look a uh, spring one small section. Okay. So, this is basically and circular. So, this is the center of the spring and the four the load as we have drawn suppose it is you are just pulling from the center this this is one spring what you have just cut out and just represented. Now, Suppose we just hold this section and you just give a rotation, all right? You give a rotation. I think if we look from this side, the rotation conforms with the direction what we have just given in the earlier slide. So, if you give a rotation, then what will happen? With respect to this phase, there will be a rotation of this phase. Now, Suppose, we, we point out this one A and B and this is C and D. Well, with respect to this one if we rotate, then the point B will be rotating with respect to what we just trying to say at the very beginning. Suppose, just turn view something like that C and C point is there. So, after rotation suppose the D has come down over here, this is the point D and this was A and this B has come down over here. Okay? So, we can see the rotation for this two, the tops of top face point D with respect to C and the in the down face B with respect to A is having the same thing because that is the assumption while we have taken up you remember in doing the simple torsion problems. However, you see the length of the fiber 
this length of the fiber is smaller compared to this length of the fiber. So, what will be the shearing strain? The shearing strain will be more. So, here we understand this if we write this as an shearing strain, this location will be what? More and at this location it will be less. That means, here that is the what we consider as an curvature effect. Now, you, you, you understand that what will be happening? Suppose we are having a, we are having a small spring okay, of the same diameter of the wire. Then you can see onto this zone the curvature effect is more. Of the same wire, if we make a large one, okay, then you can see for the same thing if we extend it, this curvature effect will be less. So, obviously that means what is happening? The ratio of D that means C equals to what is this D by D, the more and more the spring index, the more and more the spring index then what will be having the lesser the curvature effect. So, normally for the heavy coils, okay, well one of the examples that means if you have, if you see that uh, train coaches then when the, the suspensions which uses a helical springs in the railway carriages, you will be seeing that it has made of a very large diameter where relatively the coil diameters are small. So, in those cases what will happen? These curvature factors will be predominantly high. So, that is what we understand by the curvature effect. However, as I told you that the effect of curvature and the effect of direct shear together you get this value of k w. So, it is customary that instead of writing k s into 8 f d by pi d cube, we will write down this k s as k w. So, that the effect of curvature is taken into consideration. So, this is the basic equation what we use for the stresses arising in a helical spring, whether it is in compression mode or it is in tensile mode. So, once we have learned this one, then let us try to find out what is the deflection of a helical spring. Now, in the same manner, uh, you can see we have taken up a schematic view of the spring. So, these are the spring coils. Okay. I hope you are the same figure and this is the cross section of the cut and it is acted upon by the same force downward means that spring is in tensile in nature. Now, while we compute the deflection of helical spring just by simple geometry we can find out that the deflection of a helical spring will be given by this particular formula this 8 f d q by n divided by g d to the power 4 where n is the number of active coils. Now, again the question comes what is the word active means? Uh, basically, you know uh, we will be dealing with this particular term active coil after uh, uh, just after these lectures or, or these discussions. Uh, but still just to give an idea suppose this spring the F cannot just hang on to the space, it has to have some material contact. Suppose it is a spring, then normally you will see a spring norming something like this. Uh, a spring will have 
k and then your hook. So, that means this hooks where you have to put these loads. Now, this sort of situations okay, just that means putting an hook etcetera, these are although a part of a spring, but it do not contribute actually to the spring deflection of spring stresses, it, ha it has to be taken care of in a different manner. So, suppose we consider that this is the zone, this is a zone normally where we are having all the coils which contribute to the deflections or the stresses, then these many coils are what we mean by the active coils. Well, now the G I need not explain once again, you know that G is a shear modulus of elasticity. How we actually try to find out this deflection of an helical spring from the geometry? You see, uh, just a situation before the application of the F, what is happening? We have taken and cut and we arbitrarily draw a line from this point to this point and let us denote that the length of this line is L, okay, some length L of this line. You apply the force F here and also somewhere in the down and what you will be getting? That means, the spring will just extend and what will happen to this phase? You see from the earlier free body diagram that it will experience a torque like that. So, if it is experiencing a torque like that means with respect to just the earlier section, you understand what I mean to the just earlier section means I am just trying to put it like this. Okay. Now, this is the coil means it is a enter coil and this is the face. what we are considering here. That means, this is the phase F and this is the phase F. So, with respect to the center, if we draw two faces and this is a situation, all right. And now, let us consider this angle to be something like say you know, beta. So, here this angle, uh, well, we take a very small angle as a matter of fact, okay, it will be better. Just let us take a very small angle and write down this angle to be something like d beta, okay. This is the angle. Then let us imagine that with respect to this small length segment, all other all other means all other springs are somewhat are rigid, means all these springs are rigid. Only onto the entire spring you are having a rotation with of this face with respect to this. Only we are considering this small length of the spring to be active one, means actually responding to the torsional force and that is actually rotating. All other spring coils means entire spring coils that you are having, everything is rigid. Only that small portion is active where you can have a, a rotation like this. So, from this particular rotation, if we come down to this particular figure, then what will happen? The length L just due to the rotation like that, this line L will travel somewhere over here. this is the line it will come over here. Now, what you are getting? That this line has come over here and this angle, let us call this angle as a small angle d phi. Then, what is the deflection? See, this has come over here. So, if we consider a just an horizontal line through this one, then this distance is delta. 
delta uh, well I should not put its delta uh, say it is it is coming out to be d delta will it be all right I think because it is under small elemental length. So, let us put this one as a d delta that means what is this d delta this d delta has come up due to the rotation of this face or this face with respect to uh, another face which is very close to this one only subtending a small angle delta beta. So, we know that to find out the deflection of the helical spring we have to find out this value of the small displacement that is created due to the <coughs> rotation of a, a segment of a small segment of the spring. So, that means we have to compute the d delta and then if we can compute d delta then immediately we can compute the delta considering the effect of all other coils for the entire spring. So, how we can take up? We can take up in this situation. Let us come down over here, just have an idea. We know uh, if, we, if, we, if we concentrate on this particular figure, this is a central line, the line was like this, it was L, it came down over here, then you are having, so this is coming over here. Uh, well, well, this is the line. So, you get a line like this and we are interested to find out this component. This is, this is the portion we would like to find out. How we can find out this line? Suppose this angle this particular angle, uh, uh, let us say um, d gamma. What is this line? Then we can see this d delta because this is the thing and what is this length? We had denoted this angle as delta phi. So, it is this length is L d phi. So, this one by this one is this sign of this angle that means it is coming out to be L d phi sin d gamma and that comes out to be L d phi sin d gamma what we can find out this sign this is the same thing and if you consider how much this is d by 2. So, that comes out to be into d by 2 divided by L. So, that is a sign gamma. So, this comes out to be d phi into d by 2. What is basically we want to find out is a value of d phi. How we can get the value of d phi? Let us go down to the basic concept of the phi we know. It was T L by G I P. Okay? That was the fundamental equation for the shaft rotation we did it earlier. So, taking the help of this equation, we find out that the small angle d phi will be created by what? Torque as usual f into d by 2 and multiplied by L. What is this L? You remember that we consider this as the segment a spring segment of this length. Okay. So, this was angle, angle d beta. What is this one? So, this L or here L will be replaced by a d L, the small elemental length. 
and this length we can find out in which way this distance is d by 2 and this is r d theta means d by 2 into delta beta. This is this length alright. So, you substitute this one with d by 2 into delta beta g what is the value of i p pi d to the power 4 by 32. So, oh, oh please excuse me, I have just drawn the end and then this is the d phi. into pi d to the power 4 by 32. Let us simplify this expression, then we get this value of d phi and that comes out to be equals to 8 into f d square delta beta by g pi d to the power 4. This value again we substitute over here. Okay. So, if we substitute here then what we get? We will be getting an expression. I think this is no more required. We can erase this portion. Okay. So, this one d delta comes out to be how much? We are substituting this one. So, 2 2 cancels. So, 4 f what? d cube d into d d cube delta beta by g pi d to the power 4. All right. So, what we will be getting? The value of delta integral 0 to this was only for a small segment of the coil and now we integrate for the enter 2 pi is one coil and number of coils for enter angle this is a delta beta angle. So, we go by 1 is 2 pi we go by number of coils and it is 2 pi n. So, if we integrate it is and it is coming out to be 4 f d cube d beta divided by g pi d to the power 4. That comes out to be how much? 2 into pi 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 and pi will cancel out. So, this delta beta will be simply beta and this 2 pi n will be substituted. So, you understand this will be coming out to be 2 8 f d cube remaining as it is 2 pi n this pi this pi cancels n remains 2 gets multiplied by 4 with 8. So, this is n divided by g d to the power 4. So, you can see so we go down to this one and in that precisely we see that delta equals to delta equals to 8 f d cube into number of active coils divided by g d to the power 4. So, we find a very simple relationship to find out the deflection of the helical spring. Now, uh, basically what we require in this case the stresses that is arising into the coil, so that you can take the proper material or the dimensions of the coil and where the spring parameters are its length, its diameter of the wire, diameter of the coil and the desired deflection what is coming into picture. So, this will give you 
the total deflection of helical spring as well as the stresses. So, this once we find out then we can have the design conditions. Now, let us go to another aspects of the spring design which is coming out to be the design of helical springs for variable load. Now, normally what we have seen the stresses what is coming into picture and the deflections uh, everything is uh, just what we calculated right now uh, will be main, mostly meant for the uh, static loading conditions. Well, the basic stress equations remain same. Uh, however, uh, the deflection of the spring is universal it can be for variable load or the static load does not matter. But anyway the stresses what we have derived that equation is, is a condition where the loads are static in nature. But as a factor of as a matter of fact you know that uh, spring applications comes heavily in the conditions where the loads are not a static loading or a constant loading, but it is a variable load. Say as for a car for example, you will be having the rear suspensions uh, of the modern cars which has normally a coiled springs will be always subjected to a fluctuating load depending upon the road conditions it could go very severe also. So, we have to modify the concept of the design or the concept of analysis of stress onto the coil that is coming due to such type of variable loading. Well, uh, you see uh, one of the figures what is represented over here is something like this and you see this is called the repeated stress and uh, this is a total stress and time. You can see one important feature is that the stress is actually going in this manner. The stress is going to some maximum value and then it is coming down to a 0 value that means this tau mean is 0. Here once we call about the load we understand that this load is causing a shear stress in the spring because primarily the springs will be subjected to shear stresses only. So, what you can see is that the stress which is coming up that is a tau max and the tau mean which essentially comes out to be 0 and this we call as an repeated stress. So, obviously we know uh, from our earlier lesson what is this one this is called a stress amplitude and this is called the mean stress or the average stress whatever may be. So, in this case you can see the as because the tau mean tau, tau minimum is 0. So, the this particular mean stress is same as this particular stress amplitude and which is nothing but the tau vector tau max divided by 2 means half of the maximum stress that is occurring in the spring. What for this figure has been given? This figure has a significance. See whenever we talked about the variable load design in the earlier lecture, then you remember that one of the situation which is important is the material property and in that time whenever we consider a variable load design in addition to the material properties like yield point and ultimate strength, we require another material property that is called endurance limit. That means, the value of the material when it is undergoing a variable load or a fatigue situation we consider a endurance limit. I do not elaborate on the endurance limit because already we have done a lot on the endurance limit. Now, normally at that, that particular situation you have seen 
that the endurance limit of a material was obtained by a cyclic loading situation. That means a specimen was repeatedly loaded for complete reversal of the stresses. That means a specimen was rotating having an concentrated load at the middle that gave rise to a continuous stress repetitions of cyclic in nature means completely reversed nature. In the same manner when we consider the design of a spring then we know that spring is primarily acted upon by what the shear stresses. So, in case of variable load design condition what material property we require? We require an endurance limit of the spring material when it is undergoing a pulsating type of shear loading situation. In that case what is being done? That if you if we, we, we just can visualize the experiment like this. Suppose it is a torsion bar then what you are considering? That we are considering the torsion bar to be loaded to the maximum and 0, loaded to the maximum and then we get 0. Okay? So, that is what is being done in the case of the material testing. Why such situation comes into picture? Because if you consider a case of compressive spring or a tensile spring, then the situation is like that. Say for an example, first let us consider a compression spring. What, what will happen a compression spring in actual operation? That if a compression spring is there in between my this two, two plates, then it will go down to the maximum, then come down to the 0. It cannot go on to the reverse direction because then the spring will get loosen in contact and it will just fall out. So, what will happen? The spring will at the most will be compressed totally to a maximum limit then come down to 0. 0 is the limit beyond which if it goes like that then the spring will just fall from its seat. So, that is the reason what is happening the maximum what you can attain in case of the compressive spring is maximum load to 0 load. So, that is the reason we consider a typical experiment of that nature. So, what we, is, we see that in the next class, we will continue our discussion which is very interesting for the design of the springs when it is subjected to a variable load. Thank you.